games and everything, but not here. When he went back to ball practice, he had carried it all back there. So we were we thought we were getting Matthew unplugged this morning. A babe. I laid a baby. <laughs> Pediatric. Good morning, Otterbein. Good morning. Welcome to the house of the Lord on the eve of the Thanksgiving week. It's cold outside, but it's warm in here. Yay. We have a lot going on these days. Before we get started, I, I want to tell you a little news item. Normally I would talk about stuff like this in my Tuesday night online Bible study, but I'm not doing that this week. And I think you might see some new stuff in between now and the next time we get together. Several annual conferences held special sessions yesterday. Ours was not one of them. Um, the ones I heard of so far, Ohio, North Carolina, and Arkansas, um, for the sake of voting on a slate of churches that wanted to leave, I wanted to give you a heads up because you'll be seeing this in the news. It was far worse than I expected. Hundreds of congregations, a full third of the North Carolina conference left the denomination yesterday. So... Um, just to give you a little preparation for that. It doesn't affect us directly. But boy, is it a kick in the teeth. All right. So moving on to the good business of our congregation here. We have that family fun night coming up December 4th from 2 to 4. So please RSVP in Bishop's Hall if your family's coming to that. The community Christmas party is December 17th. We're hoping that we will have everybody here for that that evening so you can intermingle with the folks from the, from the community who have accepted the invitation so they can meet you and you can meet them. And we're going to have lots, we're going to have little ornaments for kids to put together. We're going to have um, a movie for little kids in the auditorium. We're going to have a movie for youth in the youth room. And we're going to have refreshments and music playing in Bishop's Hall. It's going to be a great time. So please come on out to that. If you're available to help us decorate the sanctuary for Christmas, um, or I'm sorry, help us decorate the sanctuary for Christmas by ordering your um, poinsettias, and the order is due next week. Uh, we've talked about the um, Salty Christian thing. That's on the um, Faith Activity Nutrition display board in, for November and December, also in Bishop's Hall. There are still some slots, I think, for the Salvation Army bell ringers. Do you know if there still are? There are. There are still some slots available for that, so please be sure to sign up. We're still having the um, free clinic here for the um, COVID-19 shots. That, um, that'll be here tomorrow from 9 to 3. Today is the Interfaith Community Thanksgiving service. I will be there. That's at um, St. Anne's Catholic Church. And that is at um, 4.30. So um, it would be great if we had some folks attending that. And finally, what brings you joy? Everyone, children, youth, and adults are invited to stop by the bulletin board in the Children's Sunday School hallway to jot down what brings you joy. We encourage you to add at least one thing each week. So we are now ready to worship our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Let us be in an attitude of worship.
We gather this day to worship God with thanksgiving. God gives us joyful songs to sing. Worship God with thanksgiving. God made us, we belong to God. We are the people of God, members of the faith community. Worship God with thanksgiving. We will serve God without holding back, for God, God is good. good. God's, God's fulfillment, fulfillment lasts, lasts forever. forever. Worship God with thanksgiving. God's chosen one, Jesus, feeds mind and spirit. Jesus is the bread of life. We turn to our hymnal, page number 694, as we rise and sing. Come, ye thankful people, come. our sins in the hope of forgiveness, we confess our sins with the certainty of forgiveness. For the scriptures assure us that we have been rescued from the power of darkness and transferred into the kingdom of God's beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. And so with that promise, that assurance, that redemption, we confess our sins before God and one another. Holy God, we confess that we have neglected to declare Jesus the king and model for our lives. We have been quick to call on others to follow the ways of Christ, yet slow to do the same. Forgive us, O God. Restore in us yet again the commitment to be more Christ-like in word, in deed, and in spirit. Amen. All things in heaven and on earth are reconciled to God in Jesus Christ. Forgiveness is ours through faith in the Lord, in whom God was pleased to dwell. Know that you are forgiven and be at peace. of this love. 
Holy God, through the generations you have spoken to us, you have sent voices crying out in the wilderness. You have sent the words of an overjoyed new father and an expectant mother. You have sent the assurance of a condemned man on a cross. Quiet in us any voice but your own, that by the power of your Holy Spirit, we might hear the words you speak to us today. Amen. Let us turn to the Psalter in your hymnal, number 789. is due to you, O God, in Zion, and to you shall vows be performed. To you who hear prayer, all flesh shall come because of their sins. When our transgressions prevail over us, you forgive them. Blessed are those whom you choose and bring near to dwell in your courts. We shall be satisfied with the goodness of your house, your holy temple. dread deeds, you answer us with deliverance, O God of our salvation, who is the hope of all the ends of the earth and of the farthest seas, who by your strength establish the mountains, being girded with might, who stills the roaring of the seas, the roaring of their waves, the tumult of the peoples, so that those who dwell at earth's farthest bounds are afraid at your signs. You make the morning and the evening resound with joy. You water its furrows abundantly, settling its ridges, softening it with showers, and blessing its growth. You crown the year with your bounty. The tracks of your chariot drip with fatness. I have that on my sheet. You apparently do not. That's because I went down below the line instead of above the line. Good thing I'm not a quarterback. Let's try verse 9. You visit the earth and water it. You greatly enrich it. The river of God is full of water. You provide its grain, for so you have prepared it. You water its furrows abundantly, settling its ridges, softening it with showers, and blessing its growth. You crown the year with your bounty. The tracks of your chariot drip with fatness. The pastures of the wilderness drip. The hills gird themselves with joy. The meadows clothe themselves with flocks. The valleys deck themselves with grain. They shout and sing together for joy. seated and prepare our hearts as we turn to page number 433 in your hymnal.
we listen for the word of the Lord. Be careful to follow every command I am giving you today so that you may live and increase and may enter and possess the land the Lord promised on oath to your ancestors. Remember how the Lord your God led you all the way in the wilderness these 40 years to humble and test you in order to know what was in your heart, whether or not you would keep his commands. He humbled you, causing you to hunger and then feeding you with manna, which neither you nor your ancestors had known, to teach you that man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. Your clothes did not wear out and your feet did not swell during those 40 years. Know then in your heart that as a man disciplines his son, so the Lord your God disciplines you. Observe the commands of the Lord your God, walking in obedience to him and revering him. For the Lord your God is bringing you into a good land, a land with brooks, streams, and deep springs gushing out into the valleys and hills, a land with wheat and barley, vines and fig trees, pomegranates, olive oil, and honey, a land where bread will not be scarce and you will lack nothing, a land where the rocks are iron and you can dig copper out of the hills. When you have eaten and are satisfied, praise the Lord your God for the good land he has given you. Be careful that you do not forget the Lord your God, failing to observe his commands, his laws and decrees that I am giving you this day. Otherwise, when you eat and are satisfied, when you build fine houses and settle down, and when your herds and flocks grow large and your silver and gold increase and all you have is multiplied, then your heart will become proud and you will forget the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. He led you through the vast and dreadful wilderness, that thirsty and waterless land with its venomous snakes and scorpions. He brought you water out of hard rock. He gave you manna to eat in the wilderness something your ancestors had never known, to humble and test you so that in the end it might go well with you. You may say to yourself, my power and the strength of my hands have produced this wealth for me. But remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the ability to produce wealth and so confirms his covenant, which he swore to your ancestors as it is today. If you ever forget the Lord your God, and follow other gods, and worship and bow down, to them, bow down to them, I testify against you today that you will surely be destroyed. Like the nations the Lord destroyed before you, so you will be destroyed for not obeying the Lord your God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. So I know I told you guys I was going to be preaching on stewardship today, stewardship in general and stewardship of time in particular, but I have changed my mind. I hope you're not overly disappointed. <laughs> try, 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 yeah, we'll, have, we'll just have to do it some other time. So con contain your sorrow and let us pray. Gracious God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. For you alone are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So this is Thanksgiving week, and my family, like most families, has Thanksgiving week rituals. Uh, so most years we celebrate it at my parents' house, and on those years when we do that, uh, family starts to gather on Wednesday, different now that we've got multiple vehicles and multiple lives whether we show up in the morning or the midday or the afternoon depends on the individual, but we start trickling in on Wednesday and then we hang out in the kitchen that evening and we cook. The next day, we get up, Thanksgiving Day. I'm usually the last one up on Thanksgiving Day and we uh, watch the parade and we cook. And then evening rolls around, of course, and we say grace over the meal. We try to get everybody to participate in that in some way. And we eat for hours, 
and then we hang out at the table afterwards and we talk. And then Friday, we kind of do it again, except Friday is roast beef day. And my mom usually splurges on a nice cut that she gets from the local place down there, Nick's. I have a separate tradition of my own. Every year, I tell the story of the first Thanksgiving, and I connect it with Deuteronomy 8. There's lots of different ways we can take it. This, you, you'll hear a version of it every year. And I, I feel compelled to do that because it's a story you're not going to hear anywhere else anymore. There were two Puritan colonies in America. One was the Plymouth Rock Colony, and the other was the Massachusetts Bay Colony. The Puritans were religious refugees. They came here because life had actually gotten dangerous for them in Europe. Europe did not want them there. They had actually sort of hopped around from country to country for a few years trying to find a safe place to be and decided that there wasn't one. So they sold everything they owned and went to North America. Now, the ones that arrived at Plymouth were the ones who called themselves pilgrims. Now, outside of Thanksgiving Day, what is a pilgrim? A pilgrim is a religious person who is on a sacred quest to a holy land, right? We usually talk about pilgrims making pilgrimages to Mecca or to Jerusalem or various other holy places around the world. So why would settlers starting a colony in North America call themselves pilgrims? Because this for them was a sacred quest. They were looking for a place to set up their own little kingdom of God. They wanted to build really the kingdom of God here in North America. This was a new start for them, a new promised land. And they arrived in the Cape Cod area in September of 1620, which was hugely problematic. They didn't mean to arrive that far north. They did not mean to arrive that late in the season. Their travel for a bunch of things going wrong, they, that's how things ended up. And it was too late in the year to get crops in the ground. So they went into the winter unprepared for winter, and the result was that a full half of them died that first winter. So in the spring, the local Native Americans had been watching from a distance, and after a heated internal debate over whether or not to do anything, they decided that they should intervene before these crazy Europeans all got themselves killed. And they did and one of them spoke English. We have the names of all these people, by the way, I just can't pronounce them, so rather than butcher them, I, I, try, I try to not. They walked in and introduced themselves. Can you imagine how surprising that must have been for these people to have a Native American walk in and introduce himself in English and say, we've been watching. <laughs> we thought maybe you could use some help. And they taught them how to use fish for fertilizer and how to grow the crops that actually worked in that area, like corn and pumpkins, beans. And they saved the colony. And I want to be clear that you know, we've got the diaries of the people who lived through this. They understood that the natives had saved the colony from starvation. So in the fall of 1621, the harvest was so plentiful after the previous year they had been through, they decided that they were going to hold a celebratory feast, a Thanksgiving feast. And they started off the day with hunting, and you know, whenever you got guys with guns, there's gonna be some plinking too. And the, this part of the story you don't hear a whole lot, except from people who wanna make a big deal about it. When the natives heard the guns going off, they thought they were being attacked and sent an armed response. And it very nearly went sideways, but thankfully everybody realized it was all a big misunderstanding before anybody got hurt, or we'd be telling a very different Thanksgiving story if we remembered the story at all. But once they fig figured out, no, no, 
that wasn't what we were doing, they in, invited them to join the Thanksgiving feast. And there seems to have been a misunderstanding at this point. We think that they meant to invite either just them or them and the chief or just the chief, but they took it to mean everybody. So they all came, all 90 of them. Now this is, this painting up here, this is from the early 20th century. The artist actually painted this painting twice. This is the second one because she found out that the first one, she had um, gotten the, the native attire all wrong. She had painted them as if they were Plains Native Americans instead of Eastern Coast Native Americans. So this is her representation once she did all the research that she realized she should have done the first time. But what's inaccurate here is the ratio. Because there were 90 Native Americans and only 52 colonists had survived the winter. So there were almost twice as many natives there as there were Europeans. And the other interesting thing about the Europeans is that after that winter, the oldest surviving member of the colony was 53. Half of the colonists were young children. And almost all of the rest, although they were considered adults, were late teens, early 20s. Talk about a very young, green, wet <laughs> bunch of people who were gathered there that day. And so they hunted, and they cooked, and they played games together. And the menu at the first Thanksgiving, which we know because they wrote it down, was cornbread, roast duck, artichokes, stewed pumpkins. I have no idea what that means. Doesn't sound good. Hot wheat cereal, prune tarts, roasted goose, fricasseed turkey, fricasseed rabbit, hominy with blueberries, and the main course, no, roast venison with mustard sauce. Well, think about it, it's what they had. And also remember, if they had sugar and spice, they had very small amounts of sugar and spice. Imagine Thanksgiving dinner making everything without sugar or spice. At any rate, this feast lasted three days. And a tradition was started, but it was different from ours. See, the Puritans were an odd bunch because they were Calvinists. And they weren't sure they believed in free will. From my perspective, they didn't. But they still believed that God rewarded good behavior and punished bad behavior in this life. So initially, every year in the fall, they would hold either a Thanksgiving feast or a fast. If it had been a good year, they interpreted that as God was rewarding them for being good this year. If the harvest was bad, they assumed they had done something to deserve that, so they would come together and have a service of repentance. But eventually, they decided that they really should have a Thanksgiving feast every year if they were still there. If, if, if we're still alive and we've got enough to be here and you know we have plenty of blessings every day, we're going to thank God for them every year in the fall. But regardless of whether they were having a feast or a fast, it was a sacred holy day. And it started off in the, ch in the church that morning. The, e the evening meal was, was secondary. I maintain that this story needs to be told every year. Why? Because I'm a history nut and I think everybody should have an appreciation for colonial America. No, that's not why. This is the story, this, no, this 1621, right? This predates the founding of the nation as we think of it from a governmental perspective by you know, well over 100 years. But this is the story nonetheless that we have chosen to be our nation's origin story. Because the purpose of the story is to remember what the American dream is all about. And it's not about a spouse and a house and 2.5 kids and a nice car in the suburbs. 
It's a very different kind of a dream. We tell this story so our children will understand why we're here as a people, what it is we're trying to accomplish, how we're supposed to get along with each other, and what the proper role of God should be in mixed company. Because this story tells us that America was born when a group of persecuted Christians were rescued from starvation by the indigenous peoples. The story says that our nation was born when the most zealous Christians who ever walked the face of the earth sat down and shared a meal with people of a different ethnicity and a different faith altogether. This story says that America was born as a blend of newcomers and natives. And it says that our nation was born under the assumption that is a land of plenty in which all of God's children can share God's blessings peacefully and thankfully. And it tells us that we were born in an act of worship. And if we forget this story, we forget who we are. So wherever you celebrate Thanksgiving this year, I would say it's your responsibility as a Christian and as an American to make sure that something about this story gets told. I try to make it easy for you guys by doing it every year myself. But your kids, your grandkids, they need to know this. Because the heart of the matter is, who are we? The Bible tells us that from time to time, the people of Israel forgot who they were, where they came from. They kept forgetting that God had saved them from slavery and starvation. They kept forgetting that God was the one who provided for all their needs. Whenever they forgot that, they got into trouble. So Moses warned them. That was the warning you heard in Deuteronomy 8 this morning. That was Moses addressing the people before they entered the promised land, giving them God's law. That chapter, Deuteronomy chapter 8, that was a central text for the pilgrims. The pilgrims took the story of the promised land and saw in it their own story. They believed they had been given a new land and that they would prosper in the new land if and only if they were faithful to God. Because they remember what God said to the Israelites when they entered the promised land. He said there were people here already. They, didn't, they abused the land. So I'm taking it away and I'm giving it to you. And if you abuse it, I'll take it from you and I'll give it to somebody else. They remember that story. But there was a big important difference between the Israelites and the pilgrims. Because when the Israelites entered the promised land, there was armed resistance. Whereas when the pilgrims arrived in Cape Cod, they were welcomed with open arms. And we could take this story in a lot of di different directions, but the one that really landed on my heart hard this week was if you look at history and the driving forces behind the big events and the big changes, history, human history, is one long list of mass migrations. This was just the first of several mass migrations of Europeans to North America that we're talking about this morning. My folks came with the mass migration in the late 19th century. My, doing the genealogy thing, our trail runs hold in the 1880s with a, with a set of tickets on a boat from England. My ancestors were economic refugees. They sold everything they had to get those tickets. They arrived with what they could carry, and that was it. Just like the refugees of the southern border today. Remember those caravans that were coming up a couple years ago? I remember hearing a story about one of the women in one of those caravans. She had saved, she was in Central America, and she had saved her money for years to buy a push cart so she could start her own business selling street food. It took years to get together the money. And the first week she had it open, every single day, street thugs stole all of her cash. And when the caravan walked by, she took off her apron, she rolled it up, she sat it down on her live stream, and she walked away from it and got in line with the rest of them. Do you have any idea the kind of emotional state somebody has to be in to do something like that? That's desperation. 
And of course, there's lots of smaller migrations. Like, for example, I was thinking this week about the statewide migration to Hagerstown via the state penitentiary system. They all have one thing in common, though. They arrive with nothing. Now, there are several mass migrations in the Bible. The Exodus is just the one that we know the best. Israel leaving Egypt and going into the Promised Land. But, you know, they weren't the only ones trying to go into the Promised Land. The Philistines wanted it, too. And that's quite a story. Philistines were a group of people who came in from the sea. Every civilization of that era, all around the eastern shore of the Mediterranean, from Egypt all the way around, said this, that the Philistines tried to invade and take some land along the coast. All of the more advanced nations were able to hold them off, which was something because that area was in the Bronze Age. The Philistines had ironsmiths. They were technologically advanced for the time. It's one of the great histories of, mysteries of history. We have no idea who they were, where they came from. But the only place they were able to get a foothold was what, is, what we would today call Gaza. And they got a foothold there, and they tried their best to take Canaan the same time the Israelites were moving in. And there were other migrations later. Lots of migrations. I personally think the Israelites get a raw deal from modern historians. They talked about like they're not people returning to their home, but people invading for a new home. But the truth is, you know, there's a couple of chapters in the Bible that make it sound like they swept in like an invading army and took it all. But if you read the whole story, once you get first through those first couple of triumphant kind of sounding chapters, you see that it wasn't like that at all. They really only fought a handful of cities, the ones that tried to stop them from coming in. The huge majority of the Canaanites ended up being part of Israel. So what ended up being Israel was a very mixed bunch of people. And when God gave Moses the law, and if you look in Deuteronomy, this chapter 8 leads into basically the whole rest of the book is the law. That law has a lot to say in it about how you treat immigrants, refugees, and what it would call foreigners among you. And the short version is you treat them with respect. It's your responsibility. Your responsibility is Israel to make sure that these people get justice when they're wrong. Why? It's very, very specific and explicit. Because you were once slaves in a foreign land. And you remember, and you will remember, what it was like. And you will not treat them the way you were treated. Now, I've had Christians tell me that these Bible stories have nothing to do with modern migration issues. And what I would say to that is, if you don't think the stories of the Bible have anything to do with modern issues, why are you a Christian? What's the point of reading any of the stories if they don't apply to us today? Mass migrations are huge disruptions, both for the migrants and the indigenous peoples. Just ask the Native Americans. Changes the course of history, right? And I wish I could say that the Bible gives us a model of migration. The, this is the story of how you get it right. Do it like this. It does not have that story. But it's safe to say that everyone involved should follow the golden rule. Treat others the way you would want to be treated in that situation. Now, some people ask today, knowing how the European migration played out for the Native Americans, why do we still tell this story today? That shared meal at the first Thanksgiving showed us that at the start, both groups went into it wanting to share the fruits of the land and the land itself. Obviously, it did not work out that way. But that first meal together was never forgotten for a reason, a powerful reason, regret. That's why it became the stuff of legend. We still tell that story for the same reason we still tell the story of the Garden of Eden. How does that story end? With regret. 
but they both tell us about what paradise was like before it was lost. They tell us where we were headed before we got off track, before things went wrong, and they, they tell us that to remind us where we should be headed and to give us hope that if we head in the right direction now, we can still get there. And for that reason, it's a story of hope. And that brings us to the main ingredient of the complete Thanksgiving holiday, which is that grace we say together over the meal, giving thanks. It's not Thanksgiving if somebody doesn't say thanks. Please do not ever call it Turkey Day in my presence. It's called Thanksgiving for a reason. We are supposed to give thanks. But look how Moses did it. Moses did not just remind the people to give thanks for what God has already done. That's actually a very small part of this chapter. If you look at what he's saying to give thanks for, he's telling the people to give thanks to God for things that haven't happened yet. To thank God as if they were already a reality. The people of Israel gave thanks because they believed that God was about to, to do great things for them and through them. And they were right. The pilgrims gave thanks, not just because God had saved them, but because they believed God would continue to do so. We should give thanks if we believe God is going to do great things through us. And I'm saying this morning to believe that God is going to do great things through us, through you. Believe it. If you are thankful and faithful to God's will for your life, someday people will tell stories about you. So let's give thanks. Let us pray. Most gracious God, you crown the year with your goodness. We praise you that you have ever fulfilled your promise that while earth remains, seed time and harvest shall not cease. We bless you for the order and constancy of nature, for the beauty of earth and sky and sea, and for the providence that year by year supplies our need. We thank you for your blessing on the work of those who plowed the soil and sowed the seed and have now gathered in the fruits of the earth. And with our thanksgiving for these blessings, accept our praise, O God, for the eternal riches of your grace in Christ our Lord, to whom with you, O Father, and the Holy Spirit, be all, all, glory, be all honor and glory and worship forever and ever. Amen. Sing praise of the Lord Jesus Christ, the firstborn, of, our of all creation, in whom all things in heaven and earth were created. Let us affirm God's sovereignty over all creation, continuing our worship through our offering of our gifts to the Lord. And as we contemplate in our hearts what we should give to the, to the Lord, let us hear a musical offering to the Lord.
mercy and love. You have granted your favor to your people, offering them redemption, salvation, and wisdom. And so we offer these gifts for your hurting and broken world. May they be multiplied to do your service. May we be strengthened to do your work. In the name of Jesus Christ, who multiplied small gifts and fed multitudes, we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let's rise and sing our final hymn, number 102. Now thank we all our God. Thanksgiving to you, O God. Thanksgiving for a glorious creator. Thanksgiving for a community that sustains us. Thanksgiving for a word to challenge us. Thanksgiving for Jesus, the way for us. Thanksgiving for your eternal hope. O loving, joyful, and careful God, thank you. Amen. <laughs>